All right, guys, this knife that you're looking at right now could get you 25 years to life, but why? Now, I did a YouTube short and admittedly, I like, I've been liking making my YouTube shorts. If you guys have been around the channel, you probably notice it. And I did a little video, just kind of a little fun video, just going over, or not really quite explaining, but it's just saying that this knife right here could get you 25 years to life if you were caught with it in certain places. And admittedly, the title was a little bit of an exaggeration. I'm not quite sure you could get exactly 25 years to life with this knife, just possessing it. Of course, a lot of laws are what you do as opposed to what you have, but undoubtedly, especially in certain states, this knife could actually legitimately get you a lot of jail time. And today I want to do a video, like in a full length video going over what this knife is, why it is that way, and kind of explaining why knife laws are dumb. Because I've been watching a lot of um, knife videos by fellow knife tubers, and they've been talking about, you know, top five illegal knives. Even I've done some of the same kind of things because I think it's kind of fun. But really explaining in this video, uh, or what I wanted to do in this video is really explain what that exactly means. Because I feel like no one in the knife community has really talked about knife laws, how they came to be, and ultimately you know breaking it down so first off let's start off talking about what this knife is what you're looking at here is kind of a relic of the past a lot of people that are new to the knife industry don't really know what this knife is but you guys who have been around for the past probably like 10 to 15 years probably do know what this is but this is a Paragon knives or Asheville steel depending they basically have like two names to their company it's either Asheville steel or Paragon knives this one of course is marked Paragon knives so that is what I will be referring to it as in this video but it is the Paragon Knives Phoenix. Now the more popular or I should say the brother to this knife was a bit more popular back in the day the Paragon Warlock and believe it or not they have actually Paragon um, Knives still does make this knife they've updated it um, given it a little bit more um, up-to-date features. They've updated the steel. These original ones are in CPM S30V, so they're a little bit older, um, but these guys can actually still be found. They, once again, like many gravity knives, they never really, really caught on, but essentially from a legal format, this is basically the same thing as the Riot or Riate, whatever you want to call them, Exos or XOM, you know, like the XO family of uh, blades. So you can think of it a lot like this those where this is a gravity knife. As you can see, gravity is required to open and close this knife. So that means by law, this is a gravity knife. Now, other things that are gravity knives that we might be a little bit more familiar with are things like balisongs. Unfortunately, I have to kind of open this one two-handed because I don't have a lot of room here to swing it around, but this is a balisong. And this one particularly is a Mantis Knives, um, I'm trying to remember what the name is, but blanking on, but it is a Mantis Knives balisong. And so that is what this guy is. And once again, the balisong song just like every ballast song requires gravity to open and close it so these two are legally the same thing and in a lot of states and a lot of countries ballast songs are um, regulated similar to out the front knives like this uh, Manticore X from Heretic Knives. Um, other things that are usually regulated are things like the Protec or something like this side button auto. This is a Protec Strider SNG. And uh, these are all legally speaking in the same type of uh, class. Now I will say in that video, a lot of people were like calling me out like, why are you showing off an illegal knife? And to be clear in the state of Alaska, there are no knife laws um, restricting the function of a knife. So all of these are perfectly legal for me to own, to carry, to use, to have. And I do know too as well, in some states, you know, things are regulated by actions. So there are some states like I believe New York, work where it's like you can have an automatic if you're hunting and stuff like that. So it, it gets weird and there's a lot of gray areas when it comes down to automatic knives um, and gravity knives and stuff like that. But needless to say, um, all of these laws against knives are 
pretty darn useless. But how did we end up this way? Like, how did we get these laws? Of course, we didn't just start a country back in 17, you know, 1770s, 1780s with these weird knife laws. Of course, automatic knives didn't exist. Heck, the first pocket clip on a knife didn't exist until like 1981. So, you know, how did we get to this point where like these knives that you see here are regulated or banned or could get you, you know, years in prison and felonious charges in you know, like the court system. So essentially, um, when I started digging into it, um, like I said, you know, a lot of knife, like, um, like a lot of pocket knives and stuff, we kind of live in this weird time where if you're new to the knife industry, you know, things like pocket clips, wave openers, stuff like that, that's all commonplace on many knives today, really weren't and honestly were not that common even just 20 to 30 years ago. Like I said, Spyderco was the first company to patent a pocket clip, like a pocket clip on a knife um, back in 1981. So given that time when a lot of the law that affected knives came into play, the knife industry was a very, very different world. And a lot of what you saw as far as knives go were things like, you know, classic slip joint knives like this that required two hands to open. And things like the Buck 110, Buck 112 were kind of your standard like EDC style knife if you even carried that. So the knife climate when knives were you know, kind of getting regulated was a very, very different climate than what we have today, where we have a lot of you know, high speed, low drag kinds of knives that um, are a lot more user friendly. Anyways, the a lot of it was essentially much like gun regulation. A lot of knife regulation came through sense, sense, uh, how should I say this? Sense, sense. <laughs> Sensualization. Um, essentially what it means is that um, a lot of the kind of like rules were proposed from sens sensitizing or just, you know, over exaggerating um, situations. However, there was unfortunately some issue with knives back in the primarily the 50s and I believe the 60s where knives, especially switchblades, were readily accessible and a lot of times um, switchblades were preferred by street gangs and, you know, different hooligans and just people who had bad intentions because it was very quickly realized that, you know, guns brought a lot of heat, a lot of attention. And of course, if you tried to use a gun, it would be very loud. Like if you tried to intimidate someone with a gun, obviously if you used that gun, it would bring a lot of attention. So, uh, Essentially, switchbladed knives were um, kind of the preference for a lot of like street gangs and for a lot of you know bad people um, back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s because you could go up to someone, say like, "Hey, I want your wallet," and you know you could hit a button, the blade comes out. It looks scary, it looks intimidating, and a lot of these you know people who had violent intentions could you know just do this and have a blade that looked or appeared scary to someone who is ill-informed and get what they want. So there is some degree of rationale to it or at least why um, you know different local state and federal governments um, or uh, agencies seek to ban these style of knives. They were intimidating knives to people and once again these types of uh, knives here are a little bit less aggressive, but the types of knives like stilettos and switchblades that were used back then, you know, they had an image and to the general public, they seemed scary. Now, once again, you know, it was one of those things where it didn't like, it, it was a lot of, in my opinion, in kind of what you can see is you know, a lot of these regulating officials were trying to make their actions look right or trying to say, hey, you know, look at me, I've helped reduce or fight crime by introducing these types of regulations. So a lot of times these different, um, so a lot of times the people in these states that helped push these regulations were really just trying to advance their own careers at the cost of people like you and me who want to own 
knives that are, you know, things like battle songs, things like gravity knives, automatics, and even though we don't have any bad intentions, much like why we own firearms, you know, the vast majority of people own firearms because they enjoy the act of shooting firearms safely and responsibly. The vast majority of knife owners enjoy owning knives so that they can use them safely and responsibly. However, like I said, one bad apple does ruin a bunch and that's kind of what happened. And so ultimately, like I said, in the late 1950s, um, you know, there were this kind of like iconic image of, you know, like greasers, which were, you know, essentially the kind of gang members of the time in a lot of your um, cities who, like I said, predominantly did use um, knives, primarily for intimidation. I don't really think a lot of these people were running around stabbing people. I mean, obviously if someone pulls out a knife, they can stab someone. I'm not gonna say that they would never do it, but I think a lot of what gave switchblades their kind of bad rap was the fact that to someone who is uneducated, you know, that very snap, that fast deployment, like what a lot of people don't understand is that this blade is no more or less dangerous than say, you know, this blade here. It's just that one of them is drawn out of a sheath and is not that scary and the other snaps very quickly into place, right? So I think there's like a lot of uh, intimidation to the generalized public about the appearance of the knife. But nonetheless, it was made in 1958. Um, a federal, or the Federal Switchblade Act was uh, enacted in 1958. And that of course regulated on a federal level the possession, ownership, manufacture of automatic blades, of course, switch blades, gravity knives, all of those such things. So unfortunately that does exist. Now, of course, with any federal law, much like, you know, um, different federal laws like on marijuana and such, the state level ultimately gets to decide and have the end say so. So like at the federal level, you know, these knives are, all of these knives you see here are illegal, but in my state, the state of Alaska, none of these knives are illegal to own here. Now, once again, that does change. If I was to, you know, drive through Canada, these knives would definitely be illegal in Canada. If I was to, you know, drive to different states in America, the laws do change. So you do have to keep in mind uh, or keep that in mind that, you know, some of these knives here may not be legal, um, but you know, that is unfortunate. Like I said, in my opinion, I think a lot of it comes back to a kind of posturing and helping grow people's careers in the legal regards, because unfortunately with a lot of, especially things like judges, you know, how judges uh, stay in their careers or become lifelong, you know, judges themselves is by passing and helping ratify laws that end up, you know, fighting crime, but realistically don't fight crime. Because honestly, if, you know, a bad person wants to get their hand on any of these knives, you know, they can find their way to, you know, get, get their hands on on a crappy Chinese, you know, automatic knife or battle song or gravity knife, like all of these things exist and can be gotten for the right price and in the right places. So unfortunately, much like many gun laws, you know, knife laws and knife restrictions definitely have not shown any statistical bearing on reducing the amount of stabbings that happen in this country. And ultimately too, it's, it's not a particularly high statistic, though higher than gun violence. <laughs> anyway, is, um, you know, like these, these laws don't show any proof. And honestly, like nine times out of 10, most people who truly stab people or truly like attack people with knives are going to use something more like this fixed blade here. Um, and honestly, most of them just use kitchen knives. Like as we've seen, especially proof positive in UK or in the UK, um, that a lot of knife attacks happen with fixed blades that are, you know, like kitchen knives essentially. And honestly, if like, if we're legitimately talking here, if you had to like fight someone or take someone down with a knife, this is gonna be a superior choice because of its longer blade length, it's more slender profile and it's full flat grind. Like this is gonna do a lot more damage to a person, whether slicing or stabbing than this is. This just looks more scary per se because it fires out with like a spring, 
but realistically speaking, if you're gonna like actually have to use a knife to hurt someone, this is going to do a lot more damage than this. And I've consistently said this in previous videos, but like I said, I really just wanna do a video really breaking down like kind of how this came to be. Hopefully it's not like too boring because I didn't wanna dig like super, super deep into the minutia of it. But it is important to know like how we got here. These laws, like I said, they didn't just pop into place. And there are different organizations out there that do fight for um, knife laws or loosening the restrictions. And luckily I will say, um, ever since I've been in the knife world and I've been doing this since about 2011, um, I have seen a lot of um, knife laws loosen up, even in my own state. I believe it was in 2012 or 2011 when the um, governor passed the law to remove all knife restrictions, like, you know, the different knife function restrictions. So you could have ballast songs, automatics and everything like that. And it wasn't too long after that, then you could actually walk into a place like Sportsman's or Cabela's or, you know, um, Bass Pro and you could buy automatic knives just like that. So it was really cool to see um, in my own state. Um, but I've also seen in many other states over the course of the years, um, places like Arizona and such have done away with knife restrictions. So it is really cool to see that happen for other people. Because like I said, at the end of the day, like all of these blades here, whether it's something like the Mantis Fly Switch, whether it's something like, you know, this ProTech or the Spyderco, like they all are knives. They're all capable of doing about the same amount of physical damage. All of these are dangerous in the wrong hands. So a lot of people too, I think were also spreading some misinformation in my YouTube shorts that these knives were banned because they were dangerous and they were causing too many like injuries and stuff. That's absolutely not the case. And I don't think that would be the leading reason for being banned. Like I said, a lot of it really comes back to, you know, politicians and, um, judges and such trying to advance their own careers by banning um, knives and subsequently making more criminals or taking criminals off the street, as they say, even though a lot of these knives were, you know, not really actually the culprit to the problem. So anyways, guys, that's enough rambling. As always, God bless and I'm out.